You are Locked On Bears, your daily Chicago Bears podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. In what will go down as Matt Nagy's final game as head coach of the Chicago Bears, the loss to the Minnesota Vikings encapsulated so much of what has gone wrong throughout the four years with Nagy as Bears head coach. This is Locked On Bears, and I'm your host, Lauren Cox. I'm an analyst for Pro Football Focus, and I'm here to bring you your daily, in-depth Chicago Bears news and analysis. You can follow me on Twitter at Cox Sports One. You can follow the podcast on Twitter at Locked On Bears. You can like Locked On Bears on Facebook. Join the Locked On Bears Facebook group for even more Bears talk. And make sure you hit that subscribe button to keep up with all of our Locked On Bears videos on the YouTube channel as well. Thanks for making Locked On Bears your first listen today and every single day. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at OnlineGambling.com, the place to be for all the latest gambling news and tips throughout the NFL playoffs. Visit OnlineGambling.com slash NFL to get the edge over the competition throughout this year's playoffs all the way to the big game. On the show today, we look back over the Bears' loss to the Minnesota Vikings, not so much like going in depth into the game X's and O's, right? I mean, the result of this game didn't matter. It was kind of a boring game for a lot of the contest. And it doesn't mean it didn't really actually mean anything, but I, I want to look at it more from a, a bigger picture perspective as far as what it represents, what it says about the team, about the head coach and, and sort of where, where it sort of leaves the organization moving forward. But then I, I do want to wrap up on, you know, a more positive celebratory note with Darnell Mooney eclipsing the 1,000 yard mark this season. And we'll sort of take a little, a few minutes here to just sort of appreciate him, his season, and kind of how remarkable it is that he was able to accomplish that in spite of everything else going on with this Chicago Bears offense. But, but in the Vikings game, it really felt like such an encapsulation of the Matt Nagy era Chicago Bears that this offense was able to move the ball a decent amount, you know, moved it pretty consistently. Almost every drive ended in Vikings territory. You know, they were able to get some plays going, particularly in the first half, you know, some decent running going. And then Dalton was able to find guys, you know, still in the short area of the field, but picking up chunks of yards, getting in third and manageable type situations and, and move the chains. And yet, you know, they'd get to the red zone and, and completely fail. And that was an area where we've seen this Bears team absolutely struggle all season. And Matt Nagy never was really able to come up with a consistent answer there. And I think that theme has been present at times throughout his four seasons. But I can't help but think back partially to like 2018, you know, the 12 and 4 season, the, the really good year, and feel like it was something where they were able to find, I don't know, different ways to make it work, whether it was the trick plays. And sometimes it wasn't even like, you know, total trickeration. They were just able to get different opportunities to get quarterbacks open, whether it was with Mitch's legs, finding receivers or tight ends or running backs or running the ball or whatever it was like, not that they were great in the red zone, but it didn't feel like it was as big of a problem early, you know, early in Matt Nagy's tenure. But over the years, the, the adjustments really did never seem to be there or against the Vikings. The number of times the bears went for it on fourth down and were unable to do so in, in some part because they were, passing in some of these situations that we would have, would have liked to see them at least attempt the run a little bit more. And don't get me wrong, right? I'm, I, I'm trying to appreciate that for so much of this season, we would see Matt Nagy either punt or take the field goal on a lot of those fourth down situations. He did take the two field goals on the first two scores that the bears had when, I mean, not as much like obvious go for it in fourth down situations, but regardless, like there've been a lot of those fourth downs where, they've just decided to instead take the points. And in his final game with nothing to really lose, he went for it on fourth down six times. They only got one of them, but at least, you know, I don't want to like, I'm not going to kill him for having gone for it on fourth down because that's something we've actually been sort of looking for them to do a little bit more and be more aggressive and good for him for trying to go for it. But passing with Andy Dalton kind of the way he did was not... Uh, not maybe not the way we would we would have wanted to go about it and not the way they they should have gone about it in this game. And again, some of those struggles here with the the run pass balance in particular, especially when it's fourth and one. 
and I know it, it's not a universal strategy to just say, yes, the running game is going to instantly get that one yard every fourth down. I mean, I think partially it depends on what type of run you call. And when you're handing it off to Montgomery and the shotgun going horizontally, that's when it's not going to necessarily get you that guaranteed one yard. But even a QB sneak type thing can fairly regularly get you that one yard type of situation. But an empty backfield and Andy Dalton getting sacked for a loss of 14 felt very Matt Nagy. And again, it's not not all the Bears problems belong on Matt Nagy's shoulder. No, but it, it did it did still feel like a lot of the same things we've seen from him. But then especially when you look at the game more as a whole, you know, the Bears going to halftime up 14 to three wasn't a perfect stellar first half, but they were in control, right? I mean, a couple of field goals and a touchdown and a two point conversion at the end of the first half, holding the Vikings to just three points. Pretty good spot to be in if, as far as like in a vacuum, just trying to win this game. But Bears go into the second half up 11. And in that second half specifically, they ran the ball nine times and passed it, I think 26 times was my count, with a 14-3 to lead to start the half. And yes, the Vikings scored right away out of the half and the Vikings scored again. And eventually when you're tied or losing, you are going to need to go to the passing game a bit more. But it felt so very much Matt Nagy Chicago Bears to finish this game with Andy Dalton attempting 48 passes in a game you led 14 to three at halftime. Like David Montgomery carried the ball 20 times, which is better than some Matt Nagy games, but in a game when you had the lead, not nearly enough. I mean, it was what Cleo Herbert got three carries and Andy Dalton had the, the scramble dive at the end zone where he picked up 11 yards. But like this was a pass first, pass heavy type performance and it was truly Matt Nagy going out in true Matt Nagy style and good for him for sticking with his guns and owning it and and losing by it you know you live by it and you die by it and it sure seemed like Matt Nagy was was willing to die on that hill in this game plus you throw in a couple of those typical like Bears busted coverages in the second half defensive type things and it was like yep okay this was this was the Matt Nagy Bears and a good final example and a good reminder of okay this is why the Bears need to move on from their head coach probably their general manager, but specifically their head coach and make that change here on black Monday. But Hey, it's only part of the equation there. I was also a little bit confused by some of the personnel decisions the team opted for. And they switched some players during the game, as far as playing your veterans versus playing your younger players in the last game of the season, when it's a little bit more meaningless, we'll kind of check in on some of the rotations there who played and who didn't and why some of those decisions were made. Next on Locked On Bears. <clears throat> it's the New Year's, which means new resolutions, maybe to eat healthier or get a little bit more fit. Well, whatever your goals are, make sure Built Bar is a part of your New Year's because Built Bar is the protein bar that tastes like a candy bar. But it's got all the nutrients of a protein bar. In fact, better nutrients than most other protein bars because all Built Bars are low sugar and low calories, but they're high fiber and high protein. And most importantly, they're all covered in 100% real chocolate. They're soft and they're easy to chew. So they really do have that taste and that feel that texture, that flavor of a candy bar, but they're actually good for you. They're not going to leave you that, that sort of sugar rush, upset stomach feeling and those empty calories that you just don't need. Built Bars are something just a little bit different, a little bit special. And I promise you will find a flavor that you love. They all are delicious. I've tried pretty much every single flavor up to this point, and there's no such thing as a bad Built Bar. You got to try them for yourself. Head on over to Built.com, enter in our promo code LOCKED15, and you are going to get 15% off your next order of Built Bars. Promo code L-O-C-K-E-D-1-5, LOCKED15, for 15% off at Built.com. We're all looking for an edge these days, and I'd like to thank OnlineGambling.com for sponsoring today's podcast. If you don't know already, OnlineGambling.com is a website dedicated to giving gamblers the edge. And throughout these NFL playoffs in particular, they're going to be providing you with the best tips, news, and more to help make your bets as informed as ever. You don't need to make emotional decisions with your hard-earned dollars. Make informed decisions with information sourced by gambling experts. So be sure to consult OnlineGambling.com before placing your bets. 
Make sure you visit onlinegambling.com slash NFL for all the latest gambling news and tips to give you the edge throughout the playoffs all the way through to the big game. Remember, onlinegambling.com slash NFL to make the most out of this year's postseason. Didn't feel like the Bears made the most out of their opportunity here with an extra game in the regular season. They at least get some guys a little bit more playing time. And let's not pretend like getting a few more snaps to a few more younger players. One game is going to make all the difference in the world in the development of your young draft picks and second year, third year players. But every snap helps and every snap counts. Every snap offers a little bit more experience against a real opponent and not just someone you're practicing against in the off season, or even before that, you know, running drills against air is just not the same as a live opponent with a real crowd, a real stadium, real stakes. Even if they're not like win loss stakes, they're still performance stakes of like, I need to do my job or else I'm going to let down the guys next to me and the fans in the stands and the fans watching at home. And so we've been sort of keeping an eye throughout the end of the season on how the bears are split playing the veteran players who may be the overall better players right now that maybe give you a better chance to win in January of 2022 versus playing your rookies, your recent draft picks that could use that playing time to gain that experience and get better for 2023 and beyond. And in this game, you know, and as we've seen the last few games, the Bears have opted to go with the veterans for the most part. But this was the first one where a couple of those sort of like, mainly like one head scratcher in particular, when, when Jason Peters starts at left tackle, it's like, okay, they're going with that. And you get it, Jason Peters is the 39-year-old veteran who came off the street and has been one of the leaders up front and consistent force in the blind side and good for Dalton and good for the quarterbacks and has been helpful and all that great stuff. Very glad Jason Peters has been able to provide the Chicago Bears so much of what he's been able to provide them this season. So when you start on the game, okay, fine. We'll, we'll, we'll accept that. We'll deal with that. But then halfway through the game, I don't remember when the exact was, second quarter, third quarter around that, Peters goes out, Tevin Jenkins comes in. And I never saw any kind of Jason Peters injury report listed, right? It wasn't like Peters doubtful to return with ankle injury. Maybe there was something and maybe it never was reported or got out because it's week 18 and no one cares. But as far as we could tell, uh, you know, as the viewing audience at home and even following along on Twitter, they sort of and didn't bench Peters, right? He wasn't playing poorly, but they clearly opted to give Tevin Jenkins some level of snaps later in that game, despite Peter's like, you know, separate from Peter's performance. And I just don't, I don't understand exactly fully why then Peter started that game when you could have just started Jenkins and given him all of the snaps in the game. And same things goes with other guys at the position. And I think if, if I'm looking to an answer as to why logistically, then it goes down as a start for Jason Peters. So Ryan Pace, if he remains on general manager, which recording this Sunday night, the Bears have not fired either Matt Nagy or Ryan Pace at the exact time of recording this. And so I, I guess I, I don't know what's going to happen with the GM. We know the head coach is going to be gone. We don't know yet what the GM is going to do. If Ryan Pace is brought back, he can point to other veteran free agents and say, he see, we brought in Jason Peters and we let him start all the way up to the end of the season. Because no one's going to remember three years from now that Peters started that game and Jenkins finished that game. So it's kind of a sneaky way to say Peters gets the start, the snaps, the credit on the stat sheet. Jenkins still gets some of the time. I, I guess I sort of get it from that perspective. But what difference does one game make for Jason Peters compared to one game making for Tevin Jenkins, right? Peters getting that 17th start. Well, he was injured, but starting that 18th week sends, you know, some minuscule amount of a message of like, see, we'll let you play in week 18 of a meaningless game if you sign in Chicago? Like, is that what it's saying? Whereas Jenkins has played so little this season that I feel like that one full game would have mattered so much more than the half that Jason Peters got. Because you, you juxtapose that with, you know, Larry Borum starts again at right tackle over Jermaine Effetti, over Elijah Wilkinson, them clearly choosing to go with the younger player. And maybe they do truly feel like, in that case, the rookie right tackle is the best option at right tackle. Whereas pretty definitively, if you're looking to purely put the best left tackle on the field, Jason Peters is right now the better left tackle than Tevin Jenkins. I mean, it's just that is what it is. And so I, I can understand where maybe Larry Borum fits the bill 
in that regard, where he's both a rookie and the better player, so it's a no-brainer to, say, to start him. But again, why does Jenkins then come in halfway through? Like, why are we, why are we making that change at that point in the game? Or you look throughout the rest of the team, right? Artie Burns starts at cornerback. Thomas Graham Jr. rotates in. And we've talked about this cornerback spot a little bit where you do, do the Bears need to see more from Artie Burns? Maybe. You know, maybe that's the motivation there. They say, you know what? We need to figure out whether Burns is a guy we want to bring back next season or not. Let's give him this playing time in week 18 for a little bit more tape to truly see what he does in this Bears defense. I can understand that, but I sure would like to see even more of Thomas Graham after the big game he had against the Minnesota Vikings. You know, that was the big game he came in for and had three pass breakups and all that stuff. So would have liked to see more than him. He did rotate in the slot and was available and, you know, some in some plenty on defense, but would like to see him potentially even more there on the outside or on offense, right? Like Khalil Herbert gets three carries and you're not going to take David Montgomery carries away from Khalil Herbert, but Damian Williams, do we need to see more Damian Williams at this stage of his career? He, he didn't get any carries, but he did catch a few passes and was a cut touchdown pass of all plays. Whereas like David Montgomery could have caught that pass. Khalil Herbert could have caught that pass. Was pretty much wide open in the end zone. Why? Why are you giving those snaps to the veteran David Montgomery? I mean, to the veteran Damian Williams when the rookie Herbert could have just gotten those. Or like you know, the wide receiver Daz Newsom got the punt returns and had a couple of nice moves there. But you know, not much on offense. Still playing Mere Bird and Marquise Goodwin ahead of him. How, how much more do we need to see from Bird and Goodwin? Maybe some, but I'm sure would have liked to see Daz Newsom a little bit more. And even, you know, defensively, I think we saw a decent amount of the rookie nose tackle, Kyrus Tonga, you know, in the rotation with Eddie Goldman. You're not going to bench Eddie Goldman for Tonga. So I, I was glad to see Tonga continuing to get some actions there. And Sam Kamara at outside linebacker, he was in there. I think he, I don't know if he got a sack or a tackle for loss, but he was, he was involved defensively. And we saw his name come up a few different times. Yeah, it was a tackle for loss in the running game and a pass breakup, but, but not a sack for Sam Kamara. And then the one other thing that bothered me personnel wise separate from playing the young guys versus playing the veterans. It, it, it just rubbed me so much the wrong way. When Andy Dalton threw the pick six to Patrick Peterson and Peterson runs it back for a touchdown. Did you notice Andy Dalton on that play? He stood still, started walking toward the Bears sideline while Patrick Peterson was still breaking tackles or juking guys or running around with the ball on his way to the end zone, right? It wasn't like... You know, some pick sixes, no one has a chance to bring them down, right? They jump the route in the flat at full sprint, and there's just, I mean, there's just nothing you can do because he's gone, right? I mean, he's got a head start, a full, you know, the wind behind him, full speed, ends okay. There's nothing you can do. But Peterson caught it, crossed field, cut back a couple times, weaved his way through Bears players, and then broke free to the end zone. And through all of that bobbing and weaving, Dalton just stood there. Like, he didn't give a crap. He was like, ah, well, darn. Like, like almost like he quit, almost like he gave up. And, like, I get it, right? It's week 18 and the game doesn't matter. But if you're going to play your veteran players and that veteran doesn't care enough to go try and make the tackle or at least pretend, hustle, give some kind of effort on his interception, sit his ass on the bench and get Nick Foles out there. Like, seriously, you have another veteran quarterback. What is Andy Dalton doing? Like, have some heart in the last game of the season, have some character, play hard for your goddamn teammates. Everyone else is out there playing their butts off. Darnell Mooney's got 125 yards, breaks the thousand yard mark that we'll get into a second. Like half of your team, at least half your team, like they're playing hard because they're professionals who care. And you throw the pick six and you can't be bothered to go maybe try and help out, maybe try and tackle the guy after you just made the really big mistake. Like get out of here with that. Like I'm glad he's a free agent and I'm glad he's gone because that's the kind of player that doesn't fit the type of culture you want in your organization. It just rubs me the wrong way when we treat Dalton like this veteran leader. And then in the last game of the season, when he needed to show some leadership, when he made the mistake, ah, well, can't be bothered to keep playing out this game despite where the Bears were at that time. I mean, it just just rubs me the wrong way in, in that type of situation. Get, get Nick Foles out there if Justin Fields isn't able to go because at that point, you got to send a message and just put Dalton down and say, all right, dude, get out of here then. You're done. You know? It's just like, it's simple stuff. Like that. And that's why there's so much frustration with how Nagy has handled this team and how Ryan Pace has built the team and et cetera. Why we leading to all these firings? But hey, we'll, we'll have plenty of Black Monday stuff to talk about here for the rest of the week. But let's, let's, let's get positive. Let's, let's, in, let's look back on the season and enjoy what was something that was pretty marvelous from 
Darnell Mooney, not only in this game, but in this season, breaking that thousand yard mark. We'll appreciate Mooney and look back on what was uh, historic is a strong word, but really a fun season from Mooney in spite of everything else. Next on Locked On Bears. Hey, Bears fans, I want to tell you about an incredible app that's great for anyone who ever drives a vehicle, anyone who puts gasoline in, in any type of motor. It's called Get Upside. And listeners of this podcast are making up to 25 cents per gallon cash back every time they fill up the tank. You just download the free Get Upside app in the App Store or Google Play, and it's that simple. There's no catch. The cash back gets added right to your Get Upside account, and then you can cash out at any time. You can direct deposit into your bank account. They can do it through PayPal if you're more comfortable that way, or you can cash out with e-gift cards to online retailers like, like Amazon and other brands. Some people who drive a lot are making as much as two to three hundred dollars a month. So you got to check out the Get Upside app, and they're giving you even more bonus free cash back when you download the Get Upside app and enter in our promo code Touchdown. They're going to give you up to fifty cents per gallon cash back on your first tank, and then twenty five cents per tank from then on out. You just download the Get Upside app and use our promo code Touchdown. Darnell Mooney didn't get the touchdown for the Bears in this game, but it was another really strong performance from the player who's certainly emerged as the Bears' top option this season and may very well be the Bears' top option moving forward. Darnell Mooney officially eclipsed 1,000 yards in this game. He had 12 catches for 126 yards on 16 targets. And I did the quick math myself, which if the NFL ends up adjusting the stats for the game, then... That'll, because sometimes they go back and rewatch and they'll take a yard away here or there. But I've got Mooney finishing the season with 81 catches, 1,055 yards, and four touchdowns. He is the 18th 1,000-yard receiver in Chicago Bears history. His, his 2021 season finishes him just ahead of Curtis Conway in 1996, just behind Marty Booker in 2001. Not that those are stellar, stellar names to be associated with, but, you know, we haven't seen prolific passing much in Chicago Bears history. We certainly did not see prolific passing this season, but Darnell Mooney still finishing what will guarantee to be top 25 wide receiver, maybe top 20. Again, the, the full NFL stat sheet by the time I'm recording this hasn't updated with everybody's yards for this week, but you can kind of like run the probabilities a little bit looking at, like I think Mooney entered the week 27th in, in passing or in receiving yards. And so then he can, you know, you add the 126 and presumably th that's going to be more than some of the other receivers around him probably had this week. So he's going to, he's going to for sure hit top 25. I'm guessing he will finish as a top 20 receiver in terms of receiving yards production. Touchdowns weren't quite there, but that's sort of the entire bears offense this season. Touchdowns weren't there with anybody. And that's what makes this so impressive, right? It wasn't just that Mooney got a thousand yards. Okay. 20 other receivers got a thousand yards this season. Big deal. But the Chicago Bears offense in particular, I don't need to tell you how much they struggled to actually throw the ball, right? But they entered week 18 dead last in passing yards this season. I don't know if Andy Dalton's 48 pass attempts for 325 yards, but maybe bumped the Bears up to 31st or 30th. But like we were talking like, Maybe the worst passing offense in the NFL, if not the worst, one of the worst passing offenses, statistically speaking. And especially thinking, you know, having had three different quarterbacks start games this season, and none of them ever really fully got into a consistent rhythm. Justin Fields came close a little bit there before he got hurt. Andy Dalton, I, sort of, I, you know, that was who he practiced with the most, Mooney did, but like, this was not a, a consistent quarterback situation for a wide receiver to be productive in. Plus, it was not quarterbacks that were even throwing downfield all that much. This was, this was a short passing offense underneath some intermediate. And Fields, Fields took some more shots, but right, it wasn't, it wasn't like Mooney got 1,000 yards because they would just send deep bombs every game and he'd catch one or two and that was it, right? He has sort of redefined himself as a wide receiver 
since coming into the NFL. And we saw a lot of it in his rookie season, but it really took that next step in his sophomore season. That, you know, at Tulane, he was known as the vertical field stretcher, right? I mean, he was the take the top off speed guide downfield vertical passing. Great. That's why the Bears took him in the fifth round because they wanted to add more of that. It's part of why he fell to the fifth round because presumably, I mean, NFL teams saw him as maybe a little bit one dimensional as a vertical receiver. I mean, I don't, again, I don't know exactly what NFL teams saw, but like that was sort of the perception, right? At Tulane, vertical route tree, vertical passing speed, a little bit undersized. That's what he did. Comes to Chicago, strong rookie season and followed into a sophomore season, becomes a well-rounded wide receiver, a great route runner, speed horizontally over the middle for the underneath check down, making guys play, making guys miss after the catch, making plays after the catch, hitting some of those intermediate routes, you know, those digs across the middle of the field, the out routes on the flood concepts, right? He could win everywhere. And that's what's so impressive about him, the way he's grown. He's, he's rounded out his game. He's developed as a wide receiver. Really, really, I think from the moment he stepped on the field as a rookie, right? I mean, he's just, he's done everything. And, so often we see, you know, rookie wide receivers come into the NFL, have a, a, a breakout rookie season. Then year two, defensive backs figure out what he does, right? They're like, oh, this receiver typically does this, and they counteract that. And then those young wide receivers have trouble having that next step, right? It's like they show us one thing, defensive backs counter that, and then you need to have a counter to their counter. Darnell Mooney has figured it out, right? Because he can do so much. He can do everything. He's not one-dimensional. He's a well-rounded receiver. And, and I think that's what makes this thousand yard season so impressive for a second year, fifth round pick from a group of five school to be able to come in and be that thousand yard receiver in such a bad bears offense. Like it, it, it's this kind of tough spot where we don't think of slightly undersized speed receivers as like a true number one wide receiver, right? Like, you know, when we think of a number one, right, it's the big bodied guy who goes up and gets the clutch catches in the situation that you need, you know, Devonte Adams, Mike Evans uh, earlier, like, you know, maybe although Beckham's a little bit smaller, but like, but you like, you could sort of go to them in those moments. But like, I, I feel like Darnold, I mean, Darnold really was clearly the Bears number one receiver this season. Is he a true number one? Maybe not in the traditional sense, but like, he consistently found ways to make plays for his offense. And that's what you ask a number one receiver to do, right? I mean, in this Vikings game, he looked like a number one receiver, right? They needed yards and he was their go-to guy. You don't consistently get 10 catches for 126 yards if you're not a number one type receiver. And that was the type of playmaking we really saw from Darnell Mooney this season. Does that mean I don't want to still pursue other potential number one type wide receivers? No. Absolutely. Resign Allen Robinson or go out and get whatever wide receiver you can afford and build, get many, many weapons for Justin Fields. I don't want to go in and say, all right, Mooney's our number one. We just need to get more Demir Birds and Marquise Goodwins to support him. No, 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 no. Let's, let's get real. Let's, let's get many good wide receivers, but we know Darnell Mooney is a very good wide receiver, right? And he was kind of the only one doing it for the Bears offense, right? It wasn't like Allen Robinson was getting double teamed the whole time and Mooney was just taking those free yards because he wasn't getting as much attention. Like they knew he was the guy. The Vikings knew he was the guy. Everyone knows Robinson hasn't been doing much for the Bears this season. Mooney was the guy and it didn't matter it's for so much of this season. And that's what's still so impressive. Like he stole the spotlight from Allen Robinson and in some ways maybe stole millions of dollars from Allen Robinson, right? If Darnell Mooney isn't here, is Robinson's production higher and entering free agency, maybe making more money? Yes. That money doesn't go directly to Darnell Mooney. And of course, Robinson wants Mooney to be productive, right? I mean, they're, they're teammates, they're friends, right? It's not an adversarial thing, but like as a result of Mooney having more yards, there were then fewer yards available perhaps for Allen Robinson. And then that's a testament to how well Mooney was able to play. So it was really fun to watch him this season. I'm excited to see what Darnell Mooney is going to be able to do next season, depending on who his head coach is, how the team continues to sort of build around him because he's the only wide receiver under contract in 2022. And you can be sure we'll break down any and all Bears wide receiver moves, coaching changes, personnel moves, all that, all throughout the offseason right here in the Lockdown Bears podcast. So I hope you'll subscribe to keep up with all of our daily in-depth Chicago Bears news and analysis. As head coaching and general manager decisions become final, 
We'll reflect back on what they did. We'll look ahead to potential replacements, potential candidates. We'll hear from the press conferences and so much more. So I hope you'll keep following along with the podcast all throughout the offseason. And in, in, in exchange, even with no more Bears football on your TVs on Sundays, I promise the Locked On Bears podcast will make it that much easier for you to bear down.